Welcome to another edition of Trail Runner Nation. My name is Don Freeman. And I'm Scott War, and we are back with an episode called Ask the Coaches. Uh, we have a couple returning Ask the Coaches coaches, and we have a new Ask the Coach coach. Is that how you say it? I would, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's introduce our first new coach for this episode. This is Jenny Quilty. Did I say that right, Jenny? Yeah, you got it. Okay. This is Jenny Quilty, and she's from Abbotsford, British Columbia. Had no idea where that is. Just think north of the border. She's in that whole Vancouver area, very close to uh, the, the big metropolitan area, but that, that's where she's from. Uh, she is an acclaimed ultra runner. The reason why we do these intros, Don, just so you know, I'm, I'm yeah. saying this just for you, Thank is you. we want our audience to know that we're not just bringing hobos off the street to answer <laughs> these questions. Um, we're bringing people with experience and with knowledge, and they've done a lot of coaching, and they've seen a lot out there. And so that's why we brought Jenny on. She has not only been a successful athlete herself, but she has a, a, a thriving business at Pacific Pine Running Company. You can find it at Pacific PacificPineRunningCo.com. We'll link it in the show notes. Don, you know where those are. Yes. Um, and, and Scott, the reason we bring great great uh, um, guests on here because it, it raises our grade point average. <laughs> we, need, <laughs> we need their help. So thanks, Jenny. <laughs> thanks, Ian and David. Our IQ level goes up a few points. It does. <laughs> it averages out the mean IQ. Anyway, Jenny most recently um, got into Western States here in 2023 with a golden ticket, and she finished an impressive 11th place this year. So we're, well, we're, we're excited to have her. Um, David Roche, you've probably heard him on our podcast multiple times, or you've listened to him on his own podcast with his wife, Megan, um, called Swap Running. Um, and you can find them at swaprunning.com or the podcast. Just look wherever you find podcasts. How many episodes have you done, David? We you know? released 174 this morning. Wow. wow. Some work all play podcast. Mm -hmm. Go check it out. It's very ridiculous. And uh, you'll either love it or absolutely hate it. And either one counts as a listen. <laughs> <laughs> Has baby Leo uh, been participating at all in any of these podcasts? <laughs> We've kept him on the sidelines. You know, he needs to earn his keep. Um, so right now we're having him do more producing than actual like um, presentations. He doesn't have any impressive finishes yet at any of the big trail races. So he needs to. Yeah, until. Until he gets a golden ticket and he's 11th at Western States, he's on the sidelines. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> and, uh, and Ian Sharman, who was just recently on another episode with us uh, a few weeks ago. Um, if you've noticed, he has a little bit of an accent. He's from the UK, but he lives in Bend, Oregon. Um, here's something that you may not know about Ian. Uh, he holds nine Guinness Book of World Records for running marathons in costumes in the fastest time. <laughs> I've got you're kidding me. I thought I had this right, and I, I screwed up again. He just raised his hands. It's an audio podcast. He's done 10. He has 10 Guinness Book of World Records running in costumes. Are they all Elvis costumes, or did you do that with different different types of costumes? Several of them are Elvis. Uh, I did Santa Claus. I did Maximus from Gladiator for the fastest film character running around Rome in the <laughs> Gladiator outfit. Um, and I did Spider-Man few times as well for fastest comic book hero which i think should also count as movie character but they said no that doesn't double dip so <laughs> anyway <laughs> anyway we're grateful to have these coaches with us and this is a special one don and i didn't come up with the questions we actually reached out on social media and asked you the listeners what questions do you have for these great coaches and we got an impressive amount of of questions we're going to try to get through as many as we can in an hour, but I doubt we're going to get to all of them. The, the Don, why thing, don't you... Oh, go one, ahead. One thing that's certain is, you know, as I read through the questions, Scott, they're better than our questions. Oh, yeah. By, <laughs> by far. And so it'll be fun to ask fresh and exciting questions from the group. So let's get into it. Let's... Uh, Jenny, you have the list of questions. Why don't... Since you're the newest coach here, is there one that <laughs> you would like to start with? Oh, great. I thought you were just going to assign me one off the bat. I was ready for it. I, I thought that might happen. Too. Like, they're going to invite me in. They're going to get me to start. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, they're all great questions. It's so nice to see what people want to know. I, let's just let's get the ball rolling. I think with, again, one that actually we can get through for sure within the time um, and move on. Uh, one that maybe has a relatively simple answer. 
Uh, number three on our list, does sauna use for heat acclimation absolutely need to be done after a workout, a workout or just any time? Um, so maybe we can start with that one. And do you want me to start with my answer too? <laughs> You, you know let's, what? Let's let's, yeah, let's yeah, let let's, Jenny choose. Let's let Jenny either answer it or assign it to somebody. Let's let the, sure. the new person here have full flexibility. Jenny, what, will, what will it be? Be, be, uh, be? Before we assign before we assign Jenny, we need to give credit where credit is due. This is yeah. from Kessel Runner nineteen eighty eight. So I don't know I what that, that is or what I a wanted Kessel you is. to read the name. <laughs> I was like, I'll leave the reading of that name and credit to you. Um, Isn't yeah, it a so I think, reference? oh, I would never catch that. You did Kessel run in 12 parsecs. Yeah. I'm a <laughs> good point. Something like that. And Sola, he's famous. Yeah. Good, good you can catch tell, there, Spider-Man. You can tell I did not go on dates in high school. <laughs> well, you All right, Jenny. I'm not to be dressed <laughs> as Spider-Man for the podcast. Since, since I don't get the reference, I can offer my answer. <laughs> oh, okay. And then I have the Googling to do. Uh, so for this one, the main idea when you go into sauna training for heat acclimation purposes is that you want to have your body be warm. So sometimes that means going in right after your run, but I don't think it has to. You just want to do something maybe to get your body temperature up a little bit, a 20 minute bike, you know, running the stairs in your house. Like for me in Canada, when I come in from a winter run, I am not warm. So I actually hop on the bike inside my house first, get my body temperature up and warm up a little bit and then go in um, so that I'm kind of primed for that heat adaptation time not spending the first 10, 15 minutes just getting up to a sweat. Hmm. I, yeah, I, I did not know that. I, I had no clue that you should be warm before you go in. That's interesting. Well, I first I want to say Jenny got went, her golden ticket was in Thailand last year at the 100 miler there, which was incredibly hot and incredibly humid. So, And she did that coming from Canada. So clearly uh, <laughs> a heat acclimation expert who is certain in practice. <laughs> and to build on that, I think it's really helpful when people think about these heat exposures, not just to think about the heat acclimation as they're understanding how their body responds and go to the mechanisms a little bit. So um, the way this works in general is that the heat exposure increases the blood plasma con con or the plasma content in your blood, essentially the liquid content. Um, and that's awesome. And that's what you get most of your heat acclimation from. If you start warmer, you don't need to be in there as long in the plasma um, stress is a little higher, but the really cool thing and why we encourage heat acclimation year round when athletes can, and it can just be one or two exposures a week rather than these big protocols is once that plasma content increases over time, you can think about what it does to your blood content generally. So because the water content expands, the red blood cell percentage goes down known as your hematocrit. If you've ever seen that on your blood test, but when the kidneys sense an offset with your hematocrit, like your hematocrit grows down a few percent it starts to release natural EPO. And a bunch of studies have come mm. out recently on cross-country skiers in particular that show if you do five weeks of heat training, it's not just the plasma content that goes up, it's the red blood cell content that goes up. That's why you've probably heard that heat training can be great altitude training. So this is an amazing adaptation to just kind of harness, even if you're in the middle of winter, not planning on mm. any heat races anytime soon. Ian, I think you had something to share too. Yeah, I completely agree with everything they've said there. <clears throat> and the fact that it, it is kind of like a second best altitude training is another bonus. But uh, I would say it's not, it doesn't seem to work quite as well as actual time at altitude. But it's good mm -hmm. a, a good second best one because most people can't afford to have the time up for one, two, three weeks of, of being really high up if they're doing a high up race. But this also means you get faster doing low altitude races. So even though you think this is maybe the thing that'll help you be a, a better hard rock runner or Leadville runner or something like that, it's also going to help with doing a road marathon at sea level. So it, it's a good thing to be doing all through the year. But yeah, I agree that the main thing is uh, if you go into it and do sauna training uh, right after you've been exercising, it's just less time in the sauna. Uh, the one kind of thing to bear in mind, I'd say, is make sure you're not getting too exhausted with it. So if, for example, you're not even training for, for a hot weather race, but you're just using it maybe to get some general benefits like we just described, just make sure that you're not adding it in like it's another training session and then you can't recover from the actual running you're doing as well. Mm. Yeah, and to like build one more thing, we're just throwing it all out there. I, <laughs> I love it. Um, sauna is the most traditional way to do this, but a lot of the recent study protocols have been focusing on hot water immersion. Fancy way to say bath or hot tub. So what I've been encouraging athletes is if they have the money to spend, getting 
like the cheapest hot tub imaginable at your house can be a very relaxing way to get a lot of the same stimulus. It might not be quite as good for Western states because a hot tub only caps at like 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's because of federal law. Um, whereas a hot uh, sauna often can get up to 180 or 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a different type of stimulus. But the studies on blood volume are at least showing the same thing. Whether that applies to heat training, a little bit uncertain. I would still say if you're training for Western states, you want a sauna. But if you're just looking for these background types of adaptations, if you have a bathtub, if you have a hot tub, you can be set up and ready to go. Yeah, one thing I was just going to add there too, dude, as you mentioned, the tub time, um, as I like to call it, is that it's actually also very, very difficult, I find. So when you are going between sauna or a hot tub or a bathtub, just be prepared mentally to maybe adjust those times a little bit. And like Ian had said, don't exhaust yourself. If you hop in a hot tub at 104, you may not last, you know, that 30 minutes, that's a long time and that's mm -hmm. okay. So just work yourself in and pay attention to how you're feeling. I would die in 30 minutes, like yeah, literally die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the other thing is over the years, I'm, I'm sure people have heard of like wearing extra clothing and other things that can do heat training. I used to do that a lot when I was preparing for Western States, mainly because I didn't have access to a sauna and not everyone does. At least everyone has a, a access, at least if not to a bath, maybe to a hot shower, that could be a, a second best thing. But the thing that you're not getting uh, if you go in a sauna or similar is you're getting the physical adaptations, but you're not getting the sensation and the, and the kind of practice and the mental side of what is it like to run when you're overly hot? And what is it like to try and cool yourself down? So I think there is still a place for some of that. Over the years, I've definitely reduced it a lot because it is a lot more stressful on the body to be running mm. in extreme heat and then adding on uh, extra layers. But I think there's still something to be said for, for being able to do that a little bit. So on race day, it's not the first time that you're then dealing with that extreme heat in a in an actual running environment, because there's a lot of it that uh, you just need to kind of get used to and a sensation of this is okay, this isn't okay. How do I pull it back from that by cooling myself with liquids and ice and stuff? But uh, I think there is still a place to do a little bit of that, but not too much because it, it has that downside of being very, very exhausting and it's miserable. I always hated that heat training. <laughs> it's way more fun doing it in the sauna, uh, much less uh, difficult for your body to get a lot of the physical adaptations needed. Well, when you're when you're out in the middle of a canyon or a trail run somewhere, you can't just exit out of the door back to normal 72 degree <laughs> weather. So you don't have that option. But that was the exact question I was going to ask. You see people getting ready for a hot race and they're wearing a sweatshirt, you know, pants and tights and a hat and gloves. When you did that, Ian, did you notice a perceivable difference? Was there an advantage? Should I even go out and try that? Did you notice uh, a positive change? Yes and no. <clears throat> it yeah. was exhausting. So that takes away from your ability to train hard at the same time, or it means that potentially you're doing too many hard sessions in a week. Uh, and that's what could be unsustainable. So maybe you get awesome heat training, but your body's tired on race day, which is going to be a big detriment to being able to perform well. So I think I, I, to some degree, got used to what worked for me, but I think it can be difficult if someone's not done it before to get it exactly right. But the sauna is definitely the, the way that I'd advocate it and the way that I would do things now. Um, because you also, you also don't want to exhaust yourself mentally before the race where you just don't want to go out in the heat anymore because it's just so miserable that on race day you think, oh, it's another miserable day rather than here's my big thing and I'm ready for it. Okay, last question from me. So should I roll up all my windows, turn the heater on and look like I'm, I'm dying inside my car so people are, start <laughs> calling 911 if they're driving next to me? Would you recommend that or is, is that foolishness? Um, what do you think? I did I, do so that one time. <laughs> you I, did I that? I've done it one time one too. To another and, and just had the heating up. It was July or, or maybe, maybe, yeah, I think it was after Western States, but I was doing some preparation for pacing someone at bad water right afterwards. So I was moving house. I had like an eight hour drive with the heating up, the windows closed, 100 degrees outside. Nuts. Um, I wouldn't recommend it because, first of all, it's pretty nasty in there with the smell and other things. And also, there's a fair chance you're going to faint and crash the vehicle. So, not <laughs> okay. Hey, Good. Jenny, um, I, I, since you recently were very successful at implementing this uh, to win your golden ticket, um, if I'm just starting out and I say, you know what, maybe I want to put some sauna work in or get in the shower and turn it up, give me an idea of how how should i start i assume we want to start small and 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 climb up how much is too much can you give us an idea for a beginner yeah so i mean it depends where you're at and what your access is like i'd say first and foremost and how you respond to heat because 
everybody is a little bit different. I consider myself actually a very poor responder to heat. It's not something I've historically been good at. So if you have ease of access, then I would say kind of start trying the actual protocol because that's when you're going to see a shift. So that meaning a seven to 10 day period of going into the sauna and working up around that 20 minutes to maximum of 30 minutes and then following the protocol after of not rehydrating for about another 30 minutes and not trying to cool yourself. And of course, if you're finding that's way too much alongside your training, like you're not recovering, you're feeling fatigued, you know, if you're ever lightheaded in there, right, then reduce the time or yeah, space it out and ease in. I think that's something that a lot of people who are getting curious about this or beginning with it could start way, way, way far away from their their race so that you have opportunities to repeat it and, and actually build that adaptation. Um, and so if it's not easy for you to access, right, that would be another reason to do it a bit less. And just know that you might not have those same heat adaptations and you might have to do that seven to 10 day block at another time when you're actually, you know, maybe two, three weeks out from your race. Um, but yeah, even as a beginner, I think it's a good thing to try the protocol, see how you feel and adjust it as you go. If you have a coach, that's a great time to talk to them, obviously, about what's going on in that. Um, but yeah, dip, like dip your toes in if that's what's available. And then I just, again, just like move it really, really far back from your race. So you're not at your high volume, you're not at you know, your highest intensity and you're not compromising your training because fitness is fitness first and foremost. Um, but yeah, you can definitely trial it out a little bit here and there. And I love that. Like, I think the understanding that these things can happen really fast in the body. So if what we're thinking about is blood volume, there was one study that came out on cyclist that did four days of interventions right after exercise, as Jenny pointed out uh, when she started answering this question, that found a 17.8% increase in blood plasma volume after those four mm -hmm. sessions. That's a massive amount. And when you think about the importance of your blood in oxygen transport and things like that, you can see how quickly these can happen. So those initial heat blood plasma things are start right away. So you don't need to have like, oh, this huge protocol just to get started. But then once you start to think about accumulating a lot of these adaptations over five or six weeks, when you get red blood cell content too, you see, well, the best time to start is now and getting some stimuli is probably still going to cause these adaptations, even if it's not to the level of these big protocols. So like if you can just do one day a week, that's probably going to do something on the spectrum of these types of interesting adaptations that are kind of at the forefront of exercise physiology nowadays. Good, Another good thing topic. I add out is just the fact that <clears throat> you're only doing this protocol for a little bit of time. If you do it for, say, 30 minutes once a week, what about the other seven days and the rest of the time? So the other thing I try and uh, make sure that my runners are doing when they're training for heat is to not get cold as well. So you don't want to be undoing that. So if you're living somewhere fairly cold and you're trying to do heat training, try to really avoid getting cold. Like maybe it's cold outside, it's winter time. Dress up even warmer than you think you need to, just so you don't get to the point of your body trying to adapt to the cold as well. Or when you're doing your run, maybe wear just a little bit more clothing than the point where you'd be totally comfortable. So you're not trying to sweat and get a heat adaptation. You're just trying to avoid undoing the heat adaptation by also having a cold adaptation because you can't do both at the same time. Hmm. Well, Scott, if we did the math on the number of questions we have and the <laughs> amount of time we spent here, <laughs> do, should, should we order lunch or something so we, <laughs> we can make it? Hey, David, why don't, you pick, why don't you pick the next podcasting. question? <laughs> um, great. I'm going to hop in with, you said David, right? I want to make sure yes, I'm yeah. not. Yep. Uh -huh. yep. 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 Great. I classic, cl great podcasting material there um, on my part. Um, okay. So I want number one here, which is from Clint Zerk. How do you figure out what your heart rate zones are? Um, and it says the three zone model or the five zone model. Um, I love this question because, you know, I love coming back to the exercise physiology and Basically, every study and um, training compilation you see nowadays talks about intensity distribution. And so, um, you know, I think you can think about this in a really holistic way, um, easy, moderate, hard. You don't need to know your heart rate whatsoever. And maybe the other coaches can talk about that too. Um, but if you're trying to dial in your heart rate, understanding the actual barriers can help you calibrate that sense of feel and perceived exertion. Um, so the general uh, background here is that the three zone model is largely used in research. It essentially is below aerobic threshold is zone one. So easy, moderate is between aerobic threshold and lactate threshold. So that's Z2 in that model and Z3 is everything above that. And then the five zone model is the one a lot of people use in training. Z1 is very easy. Z2 is kind of steady up to aerobic threshold. Z3 is more tempo-ish, but that has a lot of meetings. Z4 is threshold. Z5 is everything above that. 
Um, and so the, the thing that we like athletes to do to just get a feel for it generally is to calculate their lactate threshold. There's a lot of different ways to do this. We have some tutorials online, but the basic thing you can do is if you go out and use like a 30 minute harder effort or something like that, where the heart rate starts to stabilize in the last 20 minutes of that, the average of the last 20 minutes is generally your lactate threshold heart rate. And that is the top end of your zone two in a three zone model or in a five zone model, the one that you use for training, the top end of your zone four. Um, and if you use that, you can also calculate then the top end of your zone one or your zone two, depending on which model you're using. And that's all the rage nowadays. You probably hear about zone two training. That's this, this number. If you multiply that lactate threshold heart rate number by a certain coefficient, we like to use 0.88, um, though it varies based on the person, you can find that number. And the reason that number is so cool, that lactate threshold times 0.88, which you can do in literally 30 minutes is because it gives you a general understanding of what is the top end of what is truly easy for my physiology. And then you never need to even look at it again. It just gives you a good feel for how heart rate corresponds to effort and thus stress and stimulus. I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball here and yes, to some degree change the question to why even do it at all? Why bother <laughs> thinking mm. about heart rate zones? Because I'm not a big fan. I think that they they give an overly precise view of something that isn't that precise. Heart rate's only including some elements of how hard something is, like have some caffeine and you're going to get a heart rate spike. It doesn't mean that your body is then at an unsustainable level or similar. But mm -hmm. I, I typically just think of keeping it very simple. And when someone asks me about how to use heart rate, I think of it more as the three zone model, the easy medium kind of stuff and hard and, and the ven ventilatory threshold. So basically easy is anything where you can do a conversational kind of pace. So you could talk like this. If you start going uphill, that may no longer be uh, in that easy zone one thing. So that's probably about 80% of the running. We try and keep within that. Then the medium stuff, we're not doing too much in there, but that's still going to be long runs and parts of speed sessions will be there. And then the speed sessions will often be uh, in the kind of zone three where it's harder. So to the degree that I would use heart rate zones, uh, it would just be those three. And I would just say to people, make sure your hard stuff is hard enough, but not too hard. And we can calibrate that over time based on how it's feeling and how you're recovering. Make sure your easy stuff is easy enough and that there's not too much in the middle, but there will be some in there as well. But the main thing here is I'm trying to improve people's judgment of effort because when you're in a hundred mile race and it's hot and it's cold and it's technical and it's uphill and it's 10,000 feet versus zero feet, there's so many variables in there that heart rate isn't going to capture perfectly. The most uh, perfect example of that is if you just tried to keep your heart rate the same through a hundred mile mountain race and you were trying to keep it the same heart rate uphill and downhill, that means that probably uphill you're not pushing hard enough because it'll usually be a little bit higher there. And downhill, you're going to trash your legs to get your heart rate up to what <laughs> it was like on the uphill. And so you, you may be okay from burning through the calories and, and how sustainable that is, but you're not factoring in other things like how sore your muscles are, how much muscle damage you're getting, that kind of thing. So that's why I try to avoid being too focused on heart rates other than maybe keep it easy and keep it hard when it's meant mm -hmm. to be. So I'll let the others comment on that as just a concept there, but that does, that's the, the angle that I come from. Because I think people can get really focused on data to the degree then they lose the ability to judge things. Because if their watch doesn't tell them what to do, they don't know how to make a decision. <laughs> mm. Jenny. Yeah, yeah you had what a I'd add to, I do, yeah. I think like I'm really glad this is the direction that the question is going. Because I think again, we probably all agree in many ways with how we use these numbers and how we don't. And I find a lot of athletes also want to do this type of testing when they just get started. And we know that the lactate threshold too is one of the most changeable variables. So when we do it right at the start of training, Good point. that's actually going to maybe hold somebody back as they actually gain fitness in their program and move towards their race. So they could end up, yeah, holding themselves back quite a bit. Um, and if they instead develop what that feels like, then they're going to have a better gauge when they go into pacing their race. And exactly as Ian said, I love throwing that question back when they ask about staying up at that heart rate. I'm like, well, what are you going to do on downhill? Because that would just be, you know, extremely hard and extremely um, damaging to the muscles. And then the question just in this area too, around the three zone versus the five zone, I think, again, that's a good thing for coaches to have awareness of, but athletes are working more on developing that sense of perceived effort and feeling. <laughs> And I kind of see it in a way that when I'm talking to athletes as they get started, I might be talking to them almost more from the three zone because they may feel they have less notches or less gears that they're playing with as they get started in their running. And then as they develop that awareness, those even the different top end speed versus, you know, different 
um, like easy running paces too, they're going to dial out and it almost becomes from the five zone into that RPE discussion on a one to 10. And you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, if you're working at gear six, you should know that there's this many gears above that still. And they actually know what that feels like and runs like versus just that maybe easier part or getting started when it's easy or it's like really hard and, and working with a, a newer runner who's just trying to figure out a sustainable running pace. I, I First of all, I like that we didn't mention any numbers or any heart rates. Um, this is one thing that I used to stress about when I first started running because I was running with Don and some other friends and we'd go out and I'd have a heart rate monitor on and they'd be hovering around 125 and I'd be at 168. <laughs> and I thought, I am the most out of shape person in the whole world, but yet I could hold a conversation at 168. And 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 I found out over time talking to smart people like you, coaches, that we all are on a bell curve. Some of us have higher heart rates than others. And and then I got some advice from, I think I'm gonna credit this to Brad Kearns, who's a local local athlete um, here in the in the Northern California area. It was a elite triathlete we've had him on before and he said what he, the way that he um determines zone two which is where we need to do that 80 percent of our training if you can close your mouth and breathe out of your nose and get down the trail without too much struggle you're in zone two and so i used to use that as a, as a barometer and i would try to breathe out of my nose and as long as i can, can could keep the pace breathing out of my nose. Then I'd look down at my watch and see what that heart rate was. And that's what I used to, as David put, find my lactate threshold. I honestly, I don't know if that was scientific, you know, how it corresponded to a real lactate threshold calculation. But for me, that was the way that I calculate. And every once in a while I feel, you know, get down the trail and I go, okay, what, what, Am I am I running too hard? And I'll close my mouth and try to breathe out of my nose. It's called the, the old uh, nose test. It's a nose test, Scott. <laughs> the other thing is, as you as you become a more experienced runner, and you guys can raise your hands because we're on an audio podcast. Um, if you're running down the trail, can at any given point, could you say this is my heart rate, and then look down, and are you pretty accurate? Oh, Ian says no. no not, David not says yes. Also, I'm not concentrating on that. It's not oh, the main yeah. thing I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about, is this the right effort? And uh -huh. over the years, that changes. You know, I've been doing racing for 18 years. So my maximum heart rate or my marathon heart rate is different when I was 25 to being 43. So those numbers are, are altering. But a, a key thing here in just what is heart rate showing, it's how much blood you can pump. But it's only one half of that equation. The other half is how big is your heart? So a, a good example of this was I was at a, a speech being given by Jack Daniels. He coached a lot of Olympians. He coached Magda Boulay, for example. And um, he was saying he had two Olympians. I think it was for the Mexico City Olympics. They're both the same speed. I think it was the 1500 or the 5000 meters. And one had a maximum heart rate of about 150 and the other one about 200. They went wow. the same speed and they're about the same size. But the difference is the one with the lower heart rate would probably have a slightly larger heart. So he's getting more oxygen to his muscles because each beat is more blood being pumped around the body. So if you just think about heart rate, that's only part of that equation as well. So especially if you're thinking, oh, my friend can do 160 beats per minute. I should be trying to do 160. They are not comparable. And also even the kind of, what's it, 220 minus your age, that is maybe on average about right, but there's going to be massive variance. Well, and that's why Don, that's why Don always says that I have a Grinch-sized heart. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I have such a heart rate. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's why like i think we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater to use the old term like i understand the pushback on it but what i'm talking about is individual calibration of effort because yes athletes vary a ton there's one grayson murphy who's world world champion that we coach has a lactate threshold heart rate of 192 that's very high she can sustain that for an extended period of time um and that's what she competes at we have other. We have another athlete who's a professional who has a lactate threshold heart rate of 152. Um, so very different physiologies, but then they're calibrating their efforts. So the importance of having some feel for it, just something, at some point having an understanding of what your physiology is actually doing is just because you never have to use it later, but you get a general understanding that your perspective on it is somewhat in line with the reality that your cells are facing. And I think most athletes can get there over time through guessing and testing. But as Scott was sharing, talking about listening to his friend tell him to breathe through his nose, it's like, 
That's because Scott had no idea what he was supposed to right. do. And, and that's why, for example, the nose test has been debunked. Yes, it works for some people, but it probably depends on nose morphology and other <laughs> – like we're trying, essentially hitting two random numbers that sometimes overlap, but it could be a spurious correlation. And so most athletes, yes, you might not need to worry about it at all. But I think having an understanding of what easy actually entails, you don't need this for intervals, but that understanding ends up being really important. And a good example of why – is um you were mentioning can we estimate our heart rates and like i can usually get down like at this point very pretty close to my own heart rate but one place that has been totally thrown off is um i recently had my first case of COVID person and mm. i was always like this ain't gonna do shit i got this i'm gonna be so <laughs> strong i'm gonna positive thinking my way through it and um the other, like my heart rate has been so jacked and it's been so separated from my perceived exertion that it's told me, wait, I actually need to wow. take more downtime. So just a little type of thing can be useful, also can be very hurtful depending on how you use it. The thing that out of how I have been able to see it being useful for both my runners and for myself is looking at stuff after the fact. So I've done lots of races wearing a heart rate monitor, and it's not so much to micromanage it during it. That's what I really discourage people to do. You don't want to be looking at stuff in a race and going, oh, my heart rate is two beats too high. I've got to slow mm -hmm. down. That is not effective. What is effective is if you look at it afterwards and you're thinking, oh, that was the hill where I blew up. What was my heart rate like? Does that correspond that it was a higher heart rate than the previous hill? So you can try and use it to learn your understanding, uh, learn, learn to improve your understanding of your judgment of effort. And in something where it's more simple, like a, a road race, where maybe it's going to be a more even heart rate, a more even pacing, and then a little bit of a creep in the heart rate at the end, you can get a sense of, okay, well, did you judge that right? And if not, where's the point that it went wrong? And not just your heart rate signaling that and the pace changing maybe right after that, but also what did that feel like? And that's the bit where you can learn for next time, because you can remember what the warning signs of that were versus, oh, the heart rate is two beats too high and that's my alarm instead it's oh no this feels like it's starting to get to that point or it's too early in the race to feel like this and so you can still use it to learn i think but just not to to manage things in the moment totally well, I, totally agree yeah I, and I, I think one other problem is like what you said initially like the caffeine example i heard a great quote yeah. from phil gaimon a uh, former professional cyclist from one of his friends was oh if i just brew the coffee strong i can get up into season two on the couch <laughs> Um, and it points out that <laughs> yes. using these numbers in a precise manner, that's where it, the problem is you can think, oh, 160 mm -hmm. means 160, when in reality, 160 means this range of things that could correspond to 150 to 170, even depending on the taper status, caffeine, where you're at in your cycle, how tired you are, all these different things. Mm -hmm. So it's a general use of something that feels specific, which can be a huge hurdle, as Ian mentioned. So, um, yeah, it's about understanding your own physiology in a holistic way, but through a number, which is always mm -hmm. tricky and can get athletes in rough spots, especially as Jenny said, when they're starting out and their fitness is such a moving target. I think all of these things are so good. And I think it boils down to what trail running really is. And whether you're using numbers like cadence, heart rate, your respiration, or maybe your watch to measure these things, it's about learning to, with using these numbers to learn to listen to your body, to learn to listen yep. to its small cues that it's giving you like, hey, th this, this is happening right now. You need to, and most likely, slow down a step if you're gonna last a long time. You know, and I'm trying to discourage people from getting a, their personal best, but if you wanna go out and endure something for many hours or many miles, you've gotta listen to the clues that are coming in so that you can respond appropriately. and. And that's what I love about the sport is it's always throwing something different. It might be like David said, the middle of your cycle that you're training and how much sleep have you had, how much external stress do you have what about work? How about your sleep? There's so many other variables that come into that, that you, you have to throw these other data points out. You really need to just listen to what's happening to me right now and then make adjustments so that you can make it to the end. And that's trail running. Well, little, little offer for trail under nation listeners. I probably shouldn't do this, but if you want help calculating your lactate threshold heart rate and you have some good workout files with reliable heart rate, you can send them to my email um, and then I can add a million disclaimers too. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, you had a comment? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think it is about learning that feel. And when you ask that question about if we could look down and know our heart rate, I think with that, it's not necessarily that I'm thinking about my heart rate. It's more that I've learned 
what that feels like over time. So like what Ian was saying too, that you learn that feeling and maybe even, you know, I've actually just learned what my watch is likely reading. Um, So again, go Mm -hmm. back to that too, with different times that it picks up differently, whether it's raining, I'm cold, it's hot, if my band is loose, you know, all those things are also going to impact your data. So just being aware of that too, as a runner, and especially a trail runner, when there's a lot more jostling and bouncing, just knowing that, again, I think looking at it after and looking for that consistency over time is going to be a really key piece in understanding what you're feeling out there. Because, you know, we've all come back from those days where the data doesn't look at all like what we felt like we were doing out there. And so maybe like for David, he knows what his should look like. So he knows that's related to COVID. Whereas if you have, you know, if you never look, you won't be able to pick up on those consistencies over time. And then you might look down in a race and be completely freaked out by it. So it is a good thing to look at just in retrospect and kind of gain that understanding of what your watch tells you and what that feels like, but not not be guided by it in the moment so much. David mentioned something and then and then Don asked a question about it. And you said where you are in your cycle. I think Don interpreted that as training cycle. I interpreted that as menstrual cycle. Is there for women a difference in heart rate zones during their menstrual cycle? And Jenny, well, obviously yeah. that's a question for you, but I'm sure that David and, and Ian could chirp in here. Yeah, I think, again, like full credit, I know David um, and Ian can both talk about this too. As a female who menstruates, uh, I can say that is something personally that I see. And it it's not um, perfectly guided. Like this is something, again, a lot of females or people who menstruate can track and see their own um, changes throughout their cycle. So something I have my athletes do often is track their menstrual cycle and just associated things that they're noticing often, you know, around ovulation. So mid cycle, and then towards um, the start of a cycle or um, towards your period, you're going to see changes in body temperature, heart rate, um, sometimes during exercise, sometimes respiratory rate can feel very different in that time. So that's just something that people who menstruate can track over time. And and I don't think that we necessarily need to put up any barriers around that or say, oh, you can't do this or you can't go above that heart rate. Yeah, that's not true, um, but it is something that you can notice or feel. So when you have that day, um, especially like, so, you know, I'm bringing it all together, heat training, plus being at ovulation and having a hard workout. Yeah, you might be really hot that day and that's okay. Uh, it's good to link that to what's going on. And then when that falls on a race day, you know, maybe you dress a little lighter, maybe you start cooling a little earlier and you can use those different pieces. But yeah, like David or Ian, I'd also love to hear your input because you know lots about this too. I think Overall, Jenny like I said, said a lot it perfectly. Of, a lot of things that change. You know, that's the, one of the reasons why I don't like being too precise with heart rate, whether it's because of the time of the month, whether it is because altitude different is like there's no formula mm-hmm. that says here is your heart rate for 100 mile or at sea level. Here it is at 10,000 feet. Here it is at 14,000. And even if there were, it would be individual to you and it would change over time or it could be the food you've eaten or other things that are affecting it. So that's where the micromanagement just isn't very effective. But that judgment of effort is still going to apply at all times. And so sometimes maybe the heart rate is a warning sign, like with illness, your heart rate is higher or lower than you expect. And that's maybe a sign you've picked up a bug. And that's the first sign you get that you need mm. to be aware of that in the next few days. And then you get the other symptoms. So it, it, it definitely comes through in lots of different ways that there's no fixed number here. And of course, it's changing over time as well with uh, what pace the heart rate will correspond to as you get fitter or less fit. So, so I have an A race coming up and I'm a female in this question. Um, do I want my race date to show up at a specific time through my cycle? Do I go, oh, perfect. It landed on X day. That makes me happy. So for those of us that do menstruate, um, when's the best time to race? Well, I think there's a few different factors that play into that. So the reason I would be like, oh, yay, it's this day versus this day is probably honestly convenience and more around the race logistics of racing with mm. your period and mm. depending on the distance, right? So when you are managing that, like let's say it falls on day one of your period, that can be a powerhouse day for a lot of people. Um, others, not so much. And that's, again, just good to train through and know. Um, and then you might adjust certain things beforehand. Uh, for example, you might have a few more electrolytes in the days leading up. Um, you may adjust your race plan a little bit, or you may be just honestly, again, checking those things like where are the outhouses? Where do I have access to drop bags? What do I need? It, depending on the distance of your race and how you experience your cycle. Um, so there, yeah, there aren't, I, I like to anyways, discourage people from the mindset that there's one perfect day or one perfect time in the cycle, even though we know the hormones do shift. And sure, there may be, you know, a time where we're considered um to be better performing i think that really varies by the individual great i think it was david and then ian yeah go ahead david 
Um, my, my, my wife, Megan, is one of the, I would say, top researchers in this field in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the most fascinating places in exercise physiology right now is this exact subject in question, mm -hmm. because there's been, there was a push a number of years ago for thinking about menstrual cycle related training and how we should intervene in different ways. And recently, many review studies, um, specific intervention studies have come out showing that across the population, there actually aren't these patterns that we might have been expecting to see based on things like hormonal changes across the cycle. Um, but what I think the most fascinating part of that is not to say, oh, well, there isn't an ideal time for each individual or they shouldn't change things. I think what that actually points out for the most part is that inter -indiv like, yeah, individual variation can be so high mm -hmm. on these types of topics that finding a cross-population association is almost going to be impossible. And that's where mm -hmm. actually having data about how you feel, I think can be so helpful because that actually helps you calibrate to see where you fall. Because like, if you mm -hmm. dig into each one of these menstrual cycle studies, it's not saying there's no change. What it's saying is across all those data points, we can't get a statistically significant change or at least one with a big enough effect size. But if we zoom in on one data point, you'll go, okay, that's a human whose experience matters. And it's like, well, that person is performing 7% worse on this day. And for that data point, like it's the real effect, even if it might not apply to everybody else. And so menstrual cycle in particular, given everyone's different hormonal context, seems like the, you know, absolute ground floor of where exercise physiology and statistics meet like the fact that we're all living individual unique lives. Yeah. So you learn you is the bottom line mm -hmm. there. That sounds... That sounds yeah, good. I completely yeah. agree with that. And, and the thing yeah. that I think can put this in context is there are people who can consi consistently get gold medals, who consistently win races. Think of Courtney DeWalter. There's going to be a different point in the cycle for each race. It's not like she has to have all the races land on exactly the right day to be able to win. Right. But there may be a bit of self-selection there that maybe the people who have a lower variance tend to do the very best. And the people who maybe have more off days, maybe you don't hear about them as much. They don't get the Olympic medals. So both sides that come in, but the fact is individual and learning about yourself is more important. Hmm. Well, I think it was hilarious that we started this episode thinking we could get through all of the questions. We're on question <laughs> number three. Ian, you get to choose. We haven't even okay. started well, question three. Well. We've each picked one. That That's good. We yeah. have three more podcasts with these questions already. <laughs> um, so the question I was going to pick is number four here. How to set okay. a race strategy and how does it translate to segments within the race? And that's from Peter Jans Bayes, I think. Uh, I'm not sure about the pronunciation there. But um, I think, again, this kind of flows from what we we're talking about with heart rate in particular, that you need to be judging things of how it's going, using your experience from training, using your experience from racing, so that you can put that all into the context of this race. And if you're doing a new race or a new distance, you don't have as much of a like-for-like -like comparison. So what we're trying to do with everything you do with your running is trying to improve your ability to problem solve, to be able to assess what the different variables are. So for example, it's a hot day. So maybe you think, oh, heat might be a factor today, but maybe it's something else. And that you're not just pigeonholing it into saying, well, this is what I expect to be an issue or not be an issue, and that you're able to deal with those. So the summary of that really is just that um, the different segments in the race will partly depend on how you're feeling at the different points and what you've just done previous to that, and therefore what you need to adapt to. And you'll get better and better at making good judgments and keeping it on track the more experience you get, especially if you're consciously learning, like maybe looking at the heart rate data from the last race and what did that tell you that you could do better this time. But to me, I don't really think of, of the segments too much. There's certainly some like Western states where you've got the high country, then you've got the canyons, then you've got the run down to the river, then you've got the last 22 miles from the river to the finish. So the, each race has its natural kind of slightly different points, and it might be to do with the terrain or the weather or night and day. But other than that, I think it's just being able to play the conditions and the situation you're in and having the adaptability and the flexibility for that rather than a preset plan. I really don't like people going into things with a, a plan of this is what they expect. And I just read a great quote from the, uh, the coach of Elliot Kipchoge, uh, as so a world marathon record holder. And it was saying, I don't like my runners to have expectations. I want them to have goals. And by that, mm. he means that they're aiming to do things, but they're not expecting it to go exactly to plan. So they might be expecting to run a certain time or position, but they're, they're doing that as a goal that they're aiming to do, and how they expect to feel at any point is probably going to be different. 
because nothing can be fully predicted. Uh, this race is going to be different conditioned to the last one, how you're feeling, the time of the month, any number of things are different. So not trying to get too wedded to expectations, but giving yourself the goals to aspire to that you can aim for. Jenny, do you have any, any comments on that? Yeah, I think so again, um, sorry, I have to admit, you cut out there for a bit for me, Ian, so I was trying to make sure I could hear parts of it. So if I repeat anything, just tell me to move on. Um, but I think when you look at your race day strategy, you're hopefully pulling from some of the workouts you've done and knowing how those things felt for you and using that to apply to what the goal is in the race and based on the distance, right? Are you doing a hundred miler where you're aiming more for that just above easy if it's your first one or depending on the course? Or, you know, are you working towards a higher level um, output and maybe pulling from some of the workouts so you set up what you might want it to feel like? And then aside from that, too, you're also setting out different types of goals. I think this is what Ian was just kind of talking about is you have your performance goals, but sometimes those are the really uncontrollable elements in certain ways. Uh, like, for example, you show up to a field where Courtney DeWalter's racing, right? That might impact how you perform, like what you're able to achieve if your goal was to win that race. You have a different caliber of competition, and that's amazing. Um, then you have process and outcome oriented goals as well. So those process goals can be part of the race day strategy. And those are based on the things that you are going to do for yourself to get the best out of yourself that day. And I often work with athletes on having those be something usually in the ultra world around fueling, might be around pacing. And then another area around self-talk or how you want to have your mental state be for that day. So um, when you're thinking about your race strategy, like Ian said, you're trying to develop a strong problem solver. Right. And are you also trying to develop some, you know, your the racer version of yourself where you can talk nicely to yourself the whole day? Or maybe you are um, not allowing negative self-talk to stay longer than a, few, a bit of time because it's, it's realistic that those things may pop up. And what are your strategies and your plans in those scenarios? Um, and using that throughout the different segments, you might say, OK, after this half of you know, the distance, my goal is to talk to myself and tell myself I can push and I can do this. And you might actually change the way that you're using that language in your race strategy. And then you're actually engaging in that shift um, and hopefully like seeing that come into play. And, and you can use that in your problem solving of other issues that come up or in your pacing. Um, but you're not setting yourself to a pace or setting yourself only to a time goal. And you have these other things to contribute to that. Yeah, I love I love what both Ian and Jenny said there. And to build off it and take it into like maybe a slightly different direction that might be, uh, you know, some people like it, some don't. Um, I mean, I think the way I always talk to athletes about pacing and understand different segments of races is understanding the under like the physiology that we're concerned about, especially as it relates to uphills and downhills. And so um, Ian actually, as a racer, I think is the absolute master tactician of understanding his body and understanding how substrate effects work, um, just seeing him race at Western States over the years. And so going back to our discussion a little bit about effort before, when you're on uphills, the heart rate is naturally going to rise corresponding to with a, high, a higher glycogen burn rate. So the big recommendation I have is on uphills, you need to dial back your effort so that you're not going up toward lactate threshold. Because the interesting thing that happens in the body is when you do that, when you go a little bit too hard on uphills early in a race, your burn rate the rest of the race goes up even after your effort subsequently goes down. So you can go through your glycogen stores, which is the main thing that matters in all of these races over a few hours long, relatively rapidly from just one poorly executed uphill early on. So mm -hmm. keep the uphills a little bit more relaxed than you should. It's where understanding your effort can be a little bit clutch because sometimes in race day, you don't have any idea what you're doing. You're just like, holy crap, I feel great and I'm doing this. And then you don't realize it was too hard till after the fact. Um, but meanwhile, downhills are kind of the converse that you can end up relatively letting your body flow as long as you're adapted to it musculoskeletally and used to that because your effort level is actually going to drop and you'll probably be below aerobic threshold as long as you're accustomed to these types of things. And so thinking about your effort and pacing in the context of glycogen in the burn rate that you have, that the more, the fewer of those carbs you're burning, burning on early uphills, the better, um, I think can be really helpful for athletes to break up these races into achievable chunks and to let their physiology achieve the wild things it's capable of. Like you don't need to be doing huge training volume to do incredibly, even in the longest races. Um, but to do that, you also need to understand my limiter is the substrate and what are my, what impacts my substrate burn rates. It's not the speed I'm doing. It's the effort I'm doing, as we talked about earlier, how that corresponds to, especially uphills, especially early on, take a chill pill. 
<laughs> so you're saying when you take off, if, if those who don't know Western states, you start at the bottom of a ski resort and you go, is it close to three miles to the top of escarpment? Four, four, three and a half, four. four yeah. Yeah. And if you if you go out with your, your adrenaline going, you could screw up your whole 100-mile race in that three and a half, four miles. <laughs> yeah. So amazing point, actually. Something Jenny has heard me talk about incessantly how much i'm concerned about that first three miles at western states like the i so megan i keep coming back to her because she's the like, brains of the operation but she's um the co-research director at western states and what i've wanted to do is is there a way we can isolate that one segment of the race because it is steep on roads for the most part or at least runnable if it, people want it to be and try to delineate effort level at that point and later in the race and see if we can find any corresponding changes mm, relative like correcting for people's background because my guess would be that if you could it would show just how much like one minute on that climb can lose someone an hour later as wild as that is just given how it impacts the rest of physiology you know of all these things i know ian you've got a point here I, but that, that opened up the, the this question or, or comment david i think what you stated there is so important that in the very beginning of a race, you can blow the rest of your race up, even if you do everything right. You you cause some damage to that fine crystal that your your body that you're carrying around, and you've already damaged it. And you've got to try to hold it together because of that mistake that you made on the first four miles, and there's ninety something left. You can ruin it. You've got to be smart, and maybe it maybe it goes back to the don't start too fast. Maybe that old saying is really true, but I but I think what you've you've articulated is why it's so true. You can, you can really sabotage yourself in ways that are measurable and that extend well into the race. Just from that but one mistake. You can mistake. often go relatively fast on downhills still. That's kind of the segment, to get back to the question a little bit, like the segment changes, as long as you're trained for it and mm -hmm. you've practiced it in training, because your effort's gonna naturally go down. That's why trail racing is magical. It's totally different than road marathoning in that regard um, because down, and this is where Ian, you're up, like after this, because you put this into practice in racing better than almost any athlete I've ever seen. And I've been inspired by you and how I advise athletes, because I knew every race you ever showed up with at Western States, you were going to freaking rock it out of the park. Even if your fitness was different than it was year to year, because you could always, you were always running downhills fast at the end of the race. You always moved up. You were always in the top 10. Except when I wasn't that last time, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But the, no, I think that the key thing here, so there's universal bits of advice. I would say that are a race strategy that are not specific on, on to the person. So one of them is, as mentioned by Jenny, the idea of process, the outcome, what can you control versus what can you not control? So a good example here is you can't control the weather, but you can control the, the clothing you use to deal with that weather. Like put your rain jacket on as you start to feel it raining versus, oh no, I've got to get to the next aid station. I can't afford 10 seconds to get the jacket on. Mm -hmm. So thinking about what you can do in the moment versus those outcome goals of, well, I want to be in first, but I'm in third or whatever it may be. You've just got to deal with doing the best race you can now and to get to the next aid station and the one after that and the one after that, rather than worrying too much about that being too fast or too slow for where you want it to be. But I think in terms of uh, pacing for any kind of longer race, and this even applies to a 5K, I do kind of put it in thirds. So the first third of the race has to feel easier than you think it should. The middle, you're starting to think, I'm glad I didn't go faster in the first third because now I can see it's a bit harder. And then the last third is just trying to hold on for dear life. So in a hundred miler, I'm telling people, you're trying to get 60, 70 miles into the race without being too broken, without trashing your legs, without being overheated, without all the things affecting you too much, because that's where you'll gain or lose the time. So like David said, maybe you go one minute too hard on that first climb for four miles, and that burns you out at mile 50 instead of mile 80, and you've got 30 miles where you're hemorrhaging time compared to one minute you saved in that early section. And it's that kind of trade-off. So I do get people to think about the numbers there. Um, a good example of this I heard was from uh, Bruce Fordyce, so the nine-time Comrades winner, and he was the 50-mile world record holder until recently. And he said, in a marathon, if you're one minute ahead of your optimal pace, the best your body can do at halfway, you're going to lose two minutes in the second half. In a double marathon, wow. that one minute ahead at halfway is maybe four minutes. And I would say this gets exponentially bigger. The bigger the race is, the longer the race is, that going just a tiny bit too fast gives you hardly any gain in time, but potentially massive losses of time in that last third of the race. 
Um, and so it's just thinking about it that way. And you can see it by looking at any race. If you look at last year's Western or this year's Western States results and look at the average pace throughout the whole thing, you'll just see it's dropping off for almost everyone. And for some people, massively dropping off. And then for someone like Courtney, barely dropping off. And that's why it's an amazing groundbreaking course record. But what any individual runner is trying to do is just avoid that slowdown near the end or minimize that slowdown near the end. So that's a tactic for everyone. And in, in my Western States, in my Leadvilles, I was going very easy. If you look at someone like Killian or Jim Wormsley, they look like they must be going so fast. But if you look at how hard they're breathing, it's well within themselves. So it's a fast pace, but it's an easy effort. And they could be going a lot quicker if they wanted to in these long races. So it's not like the elites take this big risk and they go off hard and the back of the pack have to take it easy. Everyone has to take it easy until that easy pace is no longer easy and you're just hanging on without falling off and a faster runner that will correspond to a faster pace throughout the whole thing. Nice, Jenny. Jenny. I think, yeah, I think yeah. something athletes often want to know is like, again, apart from in their training, how do they figure this part out? And something I was just thinking of as you were speaking to that is if your hill especially starts on an uphill or even if it's flat and it's a hundred miler, let's say, a really good test for that is if you're following your fueling plan, if you're following your hydration plan. So if you're doing that first four miles at States, for example, where you're going up the escarpment and you're running uphill and you already are thinking like, oh, I don't want to eat right now because I want to run this climb. That's often a really good sign to back right off because that, again, is going to impact you later in the day and often a sign, again, that your body is turning too many of its resources to power your muscles to run uphill and, and maybe you're actually detracting from your digestion there. So just, yeah, just a takeaway that people can have too is just check in if you're still hydrating and fueling as you're supposed to. And if you're not, maybe dial it back a bit. <laughs> mm. well, a really simple rule I would say is if you're in a really long race and you think you might be going too hard, you are. That's the rule. <laughs> right. Very easy. If it's even crossing your mind, oh, I'm breathing a bit heavily or I might be pushing a bit too much you're definitely going too hard because if, if you even think about that, you're probably pushing and that's not what you want to be doing in, in these kind of 100K, 100 mile type distances or 200 miles even more so, uh, which is a whole different ball game of how easy it needs to be. But that's a very simple rule that anyone can apply. If it crosses your mind, oh, am I pushing too hard on this hill? Yeah, you are. Like, But to, and to just tag that, where it might be ch like changing that a little bit is most athletes can train themselves to be able to run downhills pretty well. And sometimes that feels, mm -hmm. if you're not used to it, like, oh, am I going too fast? Because I won't be able to run this fast at the end of the race. But the point being, on when you're doing that, the actual effort level of what your body is experiencing on the cellular level can be much lower. So as long as your legs are adapted to it, like you're actually trained for it, it might feel like you're actually pushing a little bit. But on uphills, even for Jim Walmsley and Killian and Courtney, they do not feel like they're pushing early in the race almost ever at these longer ultras. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot of wisdom that, that we've all heard, passed on, have come at us, you know, don't start a race too fast. And another one that I'm hearing that, that relates to this is run your own race. You know, you've heard people say that, run your race. Don't get caught up in the excitement of this is my buddy or this is somebody that I want to run with or, or I don't want to have that person way in front of me because I know that means I'm not doing my best because usually, you know, we're finishing it. You got to throw all that away. You've got to run you that day, how you feel, do what, what's correct for you so that you can carry that body to the second half of the event, you know, in better shape than you were in the first half of the event, like you guys are talking about, run your race. So these, these, these old sayings and these rules stuck around for a reason, you know, they're true. What, they're what true. a great, what a great life lesson there. Don Freeman. Well, I probably need it. Tell me, what, what, <laughs> what did I miss? No, in life, be you. Run your race. Yes. Don't compare yourself, right, Ian? Oh, all I was going to say is we talked an entire podcast about this in 2022, Process the Outcome. Yeah, we went into it in a lot more depth because that is such a key skill, and people get so focused on And I do this myself. Like, if I go back to a race I won the year before, I'm very focused on the outcome of trying to win it again or trying to go faster. But the way I'm going to achieve that is through by doing the process even better than last time, not by just picking a number and trying to do the splits for that. Can we, can we put that in the notes, Scott? Can we link that episode? Cause <laughs> I, I know people are going to want to go back to it. So my big conclusion you know, is, oh yeah. you know, as, as it relates to conventional wisdom and, and wisdom that's been passed down is run your own race, but breathe through every orifice you have, not just your notes. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't supposed to well, say that when i was taking a drink David. <laughs> the, 
the thing, the the one thing that I will um, put a little plug in here is, so we've talked about race strategy. One of the things that is very valuable for something like this, if you're racing a race that you've never raced before, get a coach that may have either raced it themselves or have coached athletes that have raced it. And they can give you some insight on, you know, where are the are the places where you can take advantage of a downhill? Where are you really going to want to be careful about this? Uh, be real careful of this, this section going up to devil's thumb. You don't want to overdo it there. Really slow down. You're going to, you're going to want to run that, but you you want, you know, so I think that, that that's one of the things or get with somebody that has raced the race before, you know, trail runners are so good about sharing their own wisdom and their own experiences that, um, you know, if, if it's something that you think that you would like to get help with, um, reach out to somebody that's raced the race before a coach and, you know, and, and, and get some insight. I think that's really, really valuable. Hey, coaches, great episode. We got through three whole questions in this hour. <laughs> there's seven, um, there's seven left, Scott. We thought, we, we thought we could get through all of them. They're yeah, so we may, good. we may have. They're we so may good. have to, uh, you know, attack these other uh, questions in in the in uh, maybe one a month, uh, one episode a month. Uh, I want to make sure that ev- everybody knows uh, where you can reach these coaches. Um, Ian Sharman is at SharmanUltra dot com. Has a plethora of coaches there that uh, you know their names and they're very very good coaches. Um, Swap running and swap stands for some David. work all play. Some work, all play. Swaprunning.com also has the Swap Running podcast. It's it's really a lot of fun to listen to two really smart people sit down, and I think sometimes you're eating breakfast or lunch around the table and uh, and and just having great conversations. And then Jenny, our our, our recent newbie on the coaches, she and her um, partner Katrina Abram can be found at Pacific Pine Running Company. All the links to these will be in the show notes. Don Freeman, just in case you want to fall back on that. And I'll try to remember to to link that that podcast. I'm really impressive, impressed, Ian, that you can remember back to an episode in 2022. First of all, that we had we the conversation. And hour. secondly, I can remember the, the overall subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and I'm also impressed that you know what year it was. I, I could say, I remember an episode we did on pro- process versus outcome. I couldn't have told you what year it was. So very impressive. Uh, coaches, thank you so much. Um, and listeners, thank you so much for the questions. We uh, had some really good questions that were, uh, were posed to the coaches and we'll try to get those in uh, future episodes. But in the meantime, put on your running shoes, uh, grab a water bottle and run. Mas.